Okay, brilliant. Great. I feel like I feel like you'll appreciate this as a uh, as a man who appreciates the past, eighties and nineties aesthetics. That is one hundred percent me. There is a there is a. I was going through my computer the other day, and you know how your like favorite things, and you'll have a bookmark, and then you'll totally forget about it. And I was going back through my old bookmarks on Google Chrome, and I found this website. Uh, I'm gonna get it up. It's called, it's called something Enhance, and essentially the uh, the idea of the uh, it's like a browser game where it uh, if you turn your microphone on, it's like a it's like an image. Yeah. And then it's got like it looks like an 80s computer, and all you have to say is Enhance. Zoom left, zoom right, and you have to enhance an image slowly until you find like a cr- a number or like a an item, and you yeah. have to solve this puzzle. But it's just the coolest thing because you get to say enhance, and then it zooms in, and you just yell at your computer. That sounds fantastic. Enhance section A six. I enhance the detail, and I think there's enough to enhance. Release it to my screen. Enhance the reflection in her eye. Let's run this through video enhancement. I'm gonna get the name of it. It's uh, it and it's called enhance dot computer if you type it in it's uh it's this beautiful browser game so all you people out there with absolutely nothing to do check out enhance.computer okay predicting crime please wait and then it'll like come up with like an image or something we should have done a let's play of of enhance.computer today have you heard of the wayback machine I have heard of the Wayback I Machine. I love the Wayback Machine. I don't use it as much as I probably could. Oh, here we go. So, begin investigation. Yep, I'll do it. Oh, so, enhance. Can you can you hear this? Hang on. It's got a dope soundtrack. What's oh, enhancing? I think you just say enhance. That's not going to work for us. What if I go enhance? I think we need to zoom out. Zoom out. Know. Oh, it's zooming out. Oh, it actually worked. Yeah. Moving Nothing up. changed, though. No. Well, anyways. Zoom out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was our Let's Play of Enhanced.Computer. I, I'm sure the game, when you have a bit more time to sit down with it, is great. Yeah. Well, all of our listeners just got absolutely bombarded with that soundtrack right there because it was just fed straight into the mixer. So. And I have no idea what it sounds like. It was still. like... It was like... um. Imagine an 80s movie just where they're hacking and like, it's just background hacking music. Oh, it's like, well, that's good. Speaking of enhancing our, our show, welcome to episode 20 of the Slob Podcast, a show, an interview series that fills your ears with wild discussions, fascinating stories, and unique insights from Australia's most promising creators like Fresh from taking out the People's Choice Award at our short film festival Light Up, the man behind Faux Facade, or as some like to call it, Falk's Fackad. Mr. David Lawrence. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. So for the uninitiated, what is Faux Facade and who are you? Oh, who are you? So Faux Facade is kind of this front for everything I do. I got a day where I was like, I think I need to make a kind of like almost fake company to kind (laughs) of hide behind to kind of go, oh, look at me, I'm official. So like the word Faux Facade, facade basically cancels itself out it basically means fake fake yeah that's very true so it's like a fake fakeness for the real you yeah exactly you get two negatives makes a positive exactly and all you seem to make is positive because uh you've made a lot of good stuff and like i said we uh we hosted a film festival if you didn't already know you probably do know if you're watching this podcast because we just bombarded our socials with it but we we hosted a film festival in uh may right it was may it's been a long year i think it was may yeah and uh you submitted a film called hooked on knit which is uh one of our favorite pieces of homegrown content out there and uh on the night we had a a a voting audience vote and it it took out the most popular film of the night congratulations thank you it was it was quite a strange feeling seeing it on the big screen finally and getting was a it bit of feedback. Was it the first time you'd seen it on a on a cinema screen? Yeah, one hundred percent. Because it got rejected from every other <laughs> Brisbane film festival. I don't. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get into into that because honestly, I don't know how. I mean, look, maybe some people didn't have the balls to show it. I'm looking at you. Insert. We're not gonna name them. Nunda Film Festival. They know who they are. Did you submit it to Nunda? 
No, I didn't. So maybe they maybe they would have put it up. Maybe they would have. That's a pain. But uh, but we loved it, and that's why we got you on the podcast today. So we can talk about not just that film, but but your plethora of works, including Beautiful Brisbane, Hypermarket Heroes. You like your alliteration. I do. I just realized that right now. Focus hard. Look at that. What else? Um, I guess I guess Deep Probe Seven doesn't. Yeah, Deep Probe Seven is the most recent one. But that's fantastic. So we're gonna we're gonna go through that. Uh, but if uh, you're listening to this podcast for the first time, you can check us out on any audio platform, really. Podbean, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, whatever you like to listen on. Go give us a follow there. Give us a five-star rating because it will really help us get up the charts. Otherwise, if you're watching this on YouTube, as you probably are, hit that subcri- subscribe button. I can't even say it right. And click the bell. Always click the bell. See, I mean, all right. I'm glad we have a, a legitimate YouTube user here today. Because uh, we can we can get into what it's like to run a, a company that's that's really based around YouTube, because it can be a real pain sometimes. But yeah, hit the bell. Anyways, episode twenty. Thank you very much. This is a big deal, and we've got a good guest today. So the first thing I want to go back. I want to go back. Like you were talking about the way back machine. Yeah. I want to go way back. Right. Where we're going to, if this was if fofacade.com which I think is the is the the URL. That is the URL. We're going back to babydavid.com, okay? Oh, brilliant. We're going right back. So, so I want to know what led you to this point and and what started your your fascination with not just film but like the the specific aesthetic that you have. Well, I grew up with VHS players. That's kind of the biggest crux. Yeah. TV was a big part of my life. TV and fish fingers. <laughs> Cuz my mother worked from home and so she was very really busy, yeah, and I think the TV was a bit of a babysitter. Not saying she was negligent at all, just like the TV was a convenient babysitter, and I loved TV. Okay, I'd sit there with my fish fingers and watch the TV. I'd watch Parliament, like <laughs> because it was before Play School. Okay, um, really before Play School. Yeah, so at like wow. two p.m. they'd play Parliament, and then at three p.m. they'd play Play School. <laughs> I'd just watch anything. I loved it. Yeah, and so, so I think I watched. I remember watching The Wizard of Oz for the first time on a VHS. It was magical. Mm-hmm. I had Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory taped yes. off TV. Yeah, man. On a Betamax, which is not even a VHS. It was like the HD DVD Blu-ray yep. battle. It was the losing format. We had a Betamax player and it was taped off TV and I'd watch it with the commercials. Wow. I loved the commercials. That's good. And that's kind of where a bit of my aesthetic began with. I love a bit of product placement. Yeah. The art commercials used to be so clever and like Mm. an artistic expression backed with like consumerism. Um, So anyway, I was big into that. And Mm. around that time, I asked my mom, how do you get on the TV? Like, (laughs) <laughs> what's on the other side of that yeah she, sure she was like i guess you have to go to auditions and get an agent and i was like can i do that and she and was like dawned on you, yeah. yeah i'd rather not and <laughs> i just kept pestering her and pestering her yeah. until she just gave up and was like hey let's see what we can do mm-hmm. and i landed after many many auditions a commercial for queensland um tourism wow ran for about five years that's nuts. I have a bowl cut. Can we pull that up? Yeah, is it online? It is online. It's called the airport ad. The airport ad. Like, it, do you just put the airport ad into, into you put Google? That in there and write Shabby Do afterwards. Shabby Do. So, wow. Shabby Do is the YouTube channel. I put up things that don't belong anywhere else. Right. Stuff that is not really my official stuff. Oh, awesome. But I need it for, like, future reference. So, it's something I don't advertise. But that's well, what You just is. did. I just did our, on a podcast. To our entire audience. It will exist forever now. There are some gems up there. Okay. But yeah, so I was really into the whole acting thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I discovered Star Wars. Ooh. And I was obsessed. What age was this? This is like oh, Attack of the Clones just came yep. out. So I missed Phantom Menace, even though Phantom Menace is my favorite Star Wars movie. Is that a Damn. bad thing to admit to? No, I, I think that we live in an era where when it comes to Star Wars, there is no crazy anymore. It's just, you can love what you want and there's a there's a place for you. I Oh, good. Because I love The Phantom Menace <laughs> and I love its merchandise. I think yeah. what I've realized is, it's like my favorite Batman movies is like the two 90s ones yep. where they look yep. like toys. Totally. And it's bright colors and... 
No, that is amazing. So yeah, I really loved Phantom Menace and I got so wrapped up in Star Wars that I thought I'd like to make a Star Wars fan film. Are you about to say you made a Star Wars fan film? I have made two Star oh Wars fan God. films. Oh my God. All right, Ash, you really got to stop pulling these up. Yeah. Yeah, pull it up. Yeah, pull it up. Pull it up. It's it's a good one. It's silent, so I got paid a lot less and <laughs> I didn't talk. How much How much more do you get if you talk in an ad? A lot more. Wow, If you're really? the voiceover artist, sometimes you get paid more than the actors that showed up to the shoot. That's crazy. Yeah. I suppose there's a lot riding on your voice at that point. You know? Yeah. And at the time, it was very high and squeaky. Mm, okay. Um, so you made a Star Wars fan film. Were there lightsabers involved? Yeah, the full oh my lot. God. So this, this was, is so good. So I think it was 2005 and Revenge of the Sith just came out. Oh, yeah. do you want to watch oh, the... Here we go, yeah. Let's watch the ad. We'll, uh, we'll pull it up like legitimately as footage because you probably can't see it in the back there, but... Oh my god. So that's you dressed yeah. up as an old lady. Yeah, that the prosthetics beautiful. took hours. <laughs> that's not you, is that, it? That, that is me. Oh my god. Oh my god. That is adorable. Look how big your shoes are. Oh. Little Buster Keaton gag there. He dropped the. Yeah, and she thought I was bowing to her. And Oh my god, man. This piano is going to make me cry. Oh my god, that's so good. Yeah, it was a lot of improv. Originally, it was a cheese stick commercial. <laughs> yeah. So who was that for? Legit, like. So that was just to tell people to be nice to foreigners. Really, that's it? It was like a, like a government thing? Or? Yeah, because wow. at the time... It worked. Um, there was a bit of hostility. There was a complaint. I looked it up. Like, yeah. looking the ad up, I was like, I wonder what's online about it. There was a complaint that someone was upset that I was bowing as an Australian to a Japanese wow. woman because of the World War Two. But you didn't uh, consciously bow in the ad, right? Because you no, dropped the thing. It was a mistake. There you go. Yeah. Come on, guys. But no, it, it really, I think it helped. A lot of people remember it from the era. That's, that's so good. That makes me want to be nice to tourists. Yeah. I guess was the, was the aim of that. So there you go. And so a lot of people, when they met me back when I was a lot younger, they'd like drop their keys and wallets and were oh like, haha, you pick it up. Are you serious? Yeah. That's it so funny. got tired. How long was it on TV for? Was it just like... Five years. Five so years. So I wow. signed a thing that was like a three-year playing deal yep. and then I signed on for an extension. Wow. But they bought the rights out on that extension to yep. play for Infinity. There you go. So do you... I mean, probably not anymore, but did you get, like, royalties? Every yeah, 100%. Wow. And I That's did a Woolworths nuts. commercial where I got royalties, <laughs> and that played for about four years, but it was only during Christmas. Oh, so oh there you go. So I got about... Christmas know, money. $100 every Christmas. That's pretty good. Which was good, and I spent that on my first Star Wars figurine. There you go. Because I had always looked at Star Wars from afar and had mm -hmm, thought mm -hmm. it was great, but I didn't want to get into it. Don't know why. I was more into opera and musical theatre at the time. Of course, as all young kids are, it's, they choose between opera and Star Wars. Yeah, I went for a <laughs> space opera instead. Ah, oh, 100%. Yeah, so... That's, that's the tagline right there. Yeah. So back when Revenge of the Sith came out, yep. I thought, I'm going to refilm it. Because I had just got my first camera and I'd been begging for a camera for years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my first camera was one of the first like SD card cameras. Wow. The picture size was so small. Like it was <laughs> tiny. Yeah. And with the microphone, if you moved the camera a bit, you'd hear like this crackling noise. Like it was really uh, yeah. terrible. And I thought, I'm going to just refilm all of the scenes of Revenge of the Sith after school every day. <laughs> so I get the neighborhood together and we'd go, oh okay, we'll do the scene where Anakin kills all the younglings. <laughs> and so we just got them all in a trampoline and hit them with a stick. Just would, yes. And just it grew. Down. It grew and grew until there was a blue screen involved <laughs> and people going all over the place. Oh my God. And then it hit me. And this was probably my earliest creative thing that made this film somewhat bearable mm -hmm. and not just like plagiarism. <laughs> it wasn't plagiarism anymore. No. I made it a battle instead of like the light side of the force and the dark mm -hmm. side of the force about Coke and Pepsi. Damn. So it became like the light side of the force was Coke, 
and the dark side was Pepsi. Pepsi's better than Coke, I'm sorry. What? Yeah, Pepsi's so much better. You're a full-blown Sith Lord. I am. I am officially a Pepsi Sith Lord. But yeah, I made that film and it took me about two years to put that together. Wow. And by the end, it was a terrible, unwatchable mess. But is it available anywhere? Oh, no. Oh, damn it. But... So... Slop Shack exclude? No. No. (laughs) So I, I kind of... I left that there and that was just a side project. And okay. filmmaking as a career never never really occurred to me. Even though you'd been in an ad and you're getting the whole neighborhood together. Yeah, because I was convinced I was going to be not only an actor, uh, but okay. a musical theater actor. Damn. So like singing, acting and dancing. Mm-hmm. I can't dance to save my life. And I only discovered that once I got into a full-time musical theater mm-hmm. course. Like I can, I can dance, it's a bit awkward. but I can't like dance on cue to moves. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that it took you to you're officially like no going back. I'm here, and then uh, you're like, Ooh. yeah. So the whole time I was like, why am I hating it here? This is everything I've ever wanted, but it just didn't feel right. And as a side project, we've been thinking about B grade Star Wars. Me and my brother, we like. It was always a bit of a joke, that stupid mm-hmm. film where that happened. And we're like, you know what? Let's get back together Ooh. the original cast yep. and let's make the original Star Wars. Damn. And this one is on YouTube. Oh, wow. And this is called Big Red Star Wars, A New Coke. Damn. So it's like, uh, what are those uh, things called where they um, like they remake like trailers and stuff, but they're like... They're like really like lo-fi. It's very much like that. What is that called? I can't remember. There was a film called Be Kind Rewind. Yeah. And I think yep. they call them Sweeted versions. Sweeted. Yeah. 100%. That's it. Yep. Um, there you go. So I, I'm seeing a lot of similar things, you know, like, uh, you know, lightsaber battles, kind of like dancing, yep. consumerism. <laughs> you got your Coke and Pepsi coming in now. Yeah. You know, uh, all of these things. I like that. Yeah, this this big raid mo- Star Wars movie, the fourth one, had a lot of memes in it, like mm-hmm. early memes, like okay. old internet culture <laughs> bits and pieces, and and really obscure references and side okay. things. And I just made it on the side, and I loved it, but I didn't want to show it to anyone because I was too ashamed. Right. And I was still like, oh, I'm an I'm an actor, and then <laughs> I finished my course, and I just fell into doing production design and kind of like stage tech business okay like i was running lighting boards and yep. and no one knew i had this video skill and i in the back of my head i was like yeah i don't like film i thought film was inferior to s- live performance there you go i was such a snob <laughs> and i and everyone was like oh that film thing you did was really good and i was like no i'm yeah. not interested in film that's so funny to me yeah i'd make videos to show people because as a production designer sometimes on really low budget stuff we get actors to source bits and pieces of their costumes yeah, yeah. and i'd make videos to show them how to do it mm-hmm. and i put special effects in the videos like i shot someone in a video just because i could and it never occurred to me maybe david you want to do this yeah you've been doing it subtly like and it's just been growing in the background yeah and yeah. so for some reason, again, the B-grade Star Wars conversation comes back with me and my brother and we're like, hmm, maybe we should make another one. And instead, I came up with this idea of making a Western. <laughs> like, And it turned out to be like almost unintentionally a parody of whitewashed Westerns. Right, right. So it's very like, a, it's ridiculous. It's It's psychedelic. And it's called Gingy the Wildcat of Alabama. Oh, my God. Another is this, are these all available? Yes, this oh is God. all You're going to be seeing all the links below. We're gonna so, be some Gingy the Wildcat of Alabama. <laughs> I shot all on green screen. Yeah. Um, within about three days, it was just a bunch of people that my brother knows. Yep. And it's, it's very weird. Was there a cat in it? Yes. Was it's it? a bit like Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. Right. Okay. But about a cat. That saves the day, but he's like this plush animal that does nothing. <laughs> that that is a bit of a recurring element in your in your works, just a a plush animal. Yeah, it and this one had blatant product placement again. Like mm-hmm. Colonel Sanders from KFC is one of the lead characters at the beginning, of course, and he works on a popcorn chicken farm where he <laughs> bathes in a bucket of chicken. Like it's mayhem, this is awesome. But 
there's something inside of me was like, I'm enjoying this so much more yeah. than doing Grease for the seventh time. 100%. Like, I was doing so many productions of the same shows. I just wasn't liking it. And I was just, you know, I was just creating the visual side of things, mm-hmm. but I had this, like, flair for storytelling, and I realized I was trying to tell stories through my designs. Mm. And when you're collaborating with other people that are in charge of stories and you're trying to tell a different story through design, it's yeah. not particularly... Mm-hmm. I was like, why am I frustrated and why do I want to do this? And I'm like, David, you just really enjoy being in charge of a story. Get doing to tell your thing. own story. Yeah. yeah. And so I quit. Nice. I quit. Boom. I was wor- I mean, it's hard to get a like a steady job in the theater. Um, but I left and was like, wow. I'm going to do film stuff now. So what you got to do, you got to put it all on the line, I guess. Yeah. Motivate yourself. Yeah. And all I had was my, you know, Canon 600D. And one lens and a video mic go, not even the pro. Like, damn, that's what I was armed with. And I had this idea in the back of my head to make kind of like a web series about my favorite shopping center. So, growing up, mm-hmm. obviously in Aspley, there's a mm-hmm. place called the hypermarket. The hypermarket. Just, we were just there this morning. Actually. What? You're really at the fun. hypermarket? I picked up Ash because he lives in Aspley. <laughs> so we were there this morning and I made the joke. I was like, this is uh this is very fitting. I caught a bus from there. You could have picked me up. Oh legit? At what legit. time? I was there at kind of like nine o'clock ish. Okay, because I picked him up at nine twenty. I totally could have picked oh, him up. Oh, maybe my bus my bus came at nine ninety. I would have just left before you got there. That's very funny. Um but yeah, I was obsessed <laughs> with this place. There used to be murals on the wall and bright colours. I saw yeah. aggro there. Oh wow. Um, yeah, it is like a strange relic, that place. Yeah. It used to be kind of this Walmart type store where you could buy everything under one register yeah. and there was no other store like it. So this was some huh. really unique place, unique architecture. A lot of traveling performers went there. I saw this guy named David Hamilton. Okay. I did a puppet act and I yeah. do a parody of him in one of the Hyper Market <laughs> Heroes episodes. It has a cool name too. I think part of my appeal or like my enjoyment of the hypermarket is just purely because it's called the hypermarket. Yeah, it used to be dope. like the hypermarket. Yeah. It was the amazing place. But yeah, I love that place so much and I saw it die. I saw it slowly. There were workers there that had been there for like 30 years and they were so bitter and jaded, which is so funny contrasting with how yeah. bright and colorful it used yeah. to be. And in the original commercials, it's about how good the customer service was. <laughs> So I thought, what if I take the hypermarket back to the 80s, but take it with the attitude that people have now? <laughs> and so I went with all the bad customer service you'd receive. Yeah. And I thought that that sounds like a great idea. So I shot everything on green screen before I had any backgrounds. Yeah. And I was just like... hoped that it I, would... Yeah, yeah. I thought I'd do it like I did with Gingy. I just Photoshopped things yeah, where I'd yep. go, oh, here's a desert. I'll put in some plants. I made kind of like these visual collages and they lived within there it was very it looks good like your king skills yeah considering you're armed with a 600d yeah they good. they have improved so much over the years Still because i've just good. done so much green screen mm. but yeah so what happened was i started doing it in the same way i used to with images and things and it just wasn't looking right yeah and i thought you know what i'm going to teach myself how to do 3d modeling I'm just going to do it. And so I went out and did like (laughs) research. I went to the shopping center and like measured doorways and things and made like a scale model in Blender of the hypermarket. (laughs) I tracked down the guy that used to paint the ceiling and I found original reference photographs. So I went and made a very historically accurate version of the hypermarket and put that together. Um, I was very lucky to have some good friends that I knew that were in that show. Would you call yourself the hypermarket's biggest fan? 100%. And I put out an offer. Boom. If anyone is a bigger fan of the hypermarket, 100%. I would like to meet you. Email address is now right here. And if you have any pictures, stories, video of the hypermarket, send it my way. Um, I'd like to hear it. Because hypermarket heroes might come back. I don't know. I never say never about things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you really should. Because I was, I was watching yesterday, I did a deep dive into, into everything. And I was like, I'd watched pretty much everything else except Hypermarket Heroes. And I was like, I wonder what this is. And it's on a separate channel. Yeah. You had the whole thing going on. Because that was pro faux facade, a pre faux facade. Yeah, yeah. Very good. So, yeah, I, I finished that and I was like, you know what? 
and I got some good views. It wasn't like a viral smash, but it did quite well. It did, yeah. I was quite happy. And I and I got some good feedback from people in Aspley, but I was kind of like, this is very Aspley centric. <laughs> this is this is very specific to a small group of people. I should probably get a bit like further. Yeah. And I was happy that my so production value had gone up. I'd yep. learned a bit more about sound. Sound is my biggest weakness. Sound is the hardest thing to get right. And 100%. I'm going to put out another call out. This is like a personnel's column. If anyone knows, has a good sound operator that would like to work on quirky productions, come my way because I'm desperate. Yeah, there's there's a very like select few like professional soundies in Brisbane and they're all like just everyone's after them. If yeah. you're a good soundie, it's like you've like, you know, you're like Indiana Jones and like the Nazis are trying to come after you because they want your, you know. I want a sound operator with an indie hat. hat yeah, 100%. But the whip is also like a XLR, XLR cable. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, this is really good. <laughs> I think, and I wanted it to be my career and I thought, I think I need to go to uni and meet people because yeah. I knew as a one-man production house, it was it was just me editing everything, writing everything, filming it. I shot all of Hyper Market Heroes in one day, by the way. Wait, that whole show? That whole show. All five episodes, one day. What? That's crazy. And it was madness. Everyone was exhausted by the end. Yeah. I lived in a tiny little apartment and my bedroom became the green screen room. Yep. So I was sitting sleeping on a mattress that would go up vertical during the day and come down. It was it was Green madness. screen hurts your eyes too after a while. It like, really does. That yeah. room was... That was the best lighting I've ever done was what I did on that day for the green screen. I've never done a good green screen lighting job since then because I've been too lazy. But I spent like a whole week making it perfect Mm -hmm. and then quickly did it in a day. But yeah, I realized it was hard to do that because I was like, it's just me. I've exhausted myself setting up everything. I need a crew. So I was like, I'm going to go to uni and learn. (laughs) I'm going to enroll in uni to find a crew. Yeah, really. This this story is just so fascinating. Anyways, keep going, keep going. So yeah, I thought I'll go to uni to find the people that are out there because I'm sure there's talented people yep. out there to Can't find. Can't just be you. And so I show up to uni and I will not name which establishment this was, but it wasn't a very good one. Right. Um, but I was like, it was the only way I could get in because my OP score was low. Um, and everyone was just making memes on their computers and on their phones. And it wasn't this amazing creative utopia I hoped it would be. And I was like, it will get better. I tried I tried to reach out to find the people that would be interested, but no one was as passionate as me. Yeah. But I realized I came there to work and everyone else was like straight out of school. True. And so I dropped out after four weeks. There you go. And in the time that I was thinking of dropping out, I was thinking of moving out of Brisbane because I was I was I've been a very big Brisbane fan. Yeah. I've always loved the place where I've lived. A lot of my local heroes came from here. Um, we say you're Astley's biggest fan, but you're really Brisbane's biggest fan. Definitely, I'm one of Brisbane's biggest advocates. I'm a big fan of Expo '88. I well, uh, we'll we'll get to Expo '88. We'll, we'll I got I got questions for sure. Um, <laughs> so I was struggling with my Brisbane identity and this uni thing, and I remember listening to Lady Gaga's "A Million Reasons," <laughs> and it was and. <laughs> Baby, give me just one good one to stay was about Brisbane in my head. Wow. And something clicked within me and I was like, you know what? I tell these stories to all my friends about Brisbane icons that are absolute lies. Like (laughs) I I love taking people around the city and going, oh, look at the clock tower. Look at this. Look at the sky needle. It's actually a rocket ship. You know, stupid things like that. And then I realized, what if there's videos in this? I think Mm. there's something in this. So during something where I was meant to be writing something for uni, I knew I was pulling out. So I was like, I'll just write a script. And the guy that was meant to be looking at everything, like the tutor was like, so what's your work like? I'm like, oh, I've worked on a script about Brisbane history showing (laughs) this is this. And he gave me a weird look and I never came back. Wow. And I started Beautiful Brisbane. Imagine him just then like going online one day and he just (laughs) sees this video and he's like, wow. There you go. And so I made this conscious decision that everything I did from now on, I needed to take really seriously because I quit uni to do this. And I was like, I'm just going to full-time make videos. Not a good financial decision, but it was su- there was this fire within me. I was like, I'll make a yep. video every week. You got to do it. You got to jump in. Yeah. And so I created Warren Logie and Beautiful Brisbane. 
Warren Logie was 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 birthed. One hundred percent. He was uh, pulled out of the the Brisbane River, and <laughs> he was. It's like uh, you know, like Dumbo with like the um, the pelicans with the babies, or like what are, what are, what kind of bird is it? A stork. A stork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except it's an ibis, <laughs> and it's carrying a, like a a shitty Coles bag, and then inside the Coles bag is the 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 early birth of. 100%. Warren Logie. So I went to my local park and was like... So I, I wrote all these... About three scripts. And I was like, here we go. Let's see what happens. Went out and shot them. And they did all right. They gained a bit of attraction. Yep. And then... So the first three ones was like... I did a video on local parks. It was just a bunch of me like riffing on weird things. Did a video about the history of the Ibis. A so good. story about the Sky Needle. Because I uh, there, the, I think the best part of of beautiful Brisbane is that you you merge facts with fiction in a way where some things I'm like, is that legit or is that not legit? Where it's like I can't tell the truth, and so I just kind of have to assume that it's either all not true or it's all true, and that's the best part. Fantastic, yeah. I do know my Brisbane history. I've yeah. been I've been here for all my life. I've heard all the stories and I guess that is the success of it. And I've always been telling people Brisbane stories and they're like, you know so much, David. Yeah. You need to do something with this. Well, it's crazy because like having lived in Brisbane my whole life and I'm watching these things and I'm like, how is there not another easier way like before you did those videos for me to get my Brisbane history? So I really, you've genuinely educated, at least for me, like you've given me a knowledge of Brisbane that I wouldn't have found anywhere else. My secret is I talk to old people. Yeah. <laughs> I listen to people that are a lot older than me and yep. I soak it up like a sponge. Because like things like Expo 88 and stuff like that, like you weren't alive when these no, things happened. No, I wasn't. So like, but you have such a such an anecdotal knowledge of these things. <laughs> like, like for instance, in the Sky Needle episode, when you talk about people throwing up on the Sky Tower because they were in the German pavilion or whatever. And I'm like, how do you get tidbits like that without having lived there? Like... I do a lot of reading up. I have about <laughs> three books on Expo and I have seven yeah. copies of, wow. of the, like, I've got duplicates and there's photos and I've looked at news reports. Yeah. I've listened to people's personal stories and I've all kind of all put them together. And, oh, it was just a moment of genius. And I did those first three episodes and I was like, oh, I have to do more. There's demand. Mm -hmm. And I shot one called Brisbane City Sites, and that one blew up. Big one, yeah. Was it? Is that the biggest one out of that, all of them? That's the biggest legitimate one. There is an issue with my video on the Forex Brewery, right? Which I believe Indians are looking for porn, <laughs> and they get my video instead. So they they type in four X's rather than three, and then they get <laughs> yeah. the brewery. Um, or they really <laughs> like my humor about the beverage. What you need to do is just upload that video to Pornhub and you'll just get a ridiculous amount of views. See, exactly. That might be where I've been missing. So in I got a question. So in in the Ibis episode, right? Which is which is awesome. You you show this shot which I, I had initially thought was legit, where you have the Ibis merch, where it's like the <laughs> South Bank Parklands and then there's the pictures of the Ibis and it's like a shirt and a cup and stuff. And that's not real, right? Like no, you, I you made, made that those. myself, yeah. I would have one hundred percent buy one of those. I was thinking of starting a beautiful 100%. Brisbane merch store, and I just didn't get it off the ground, and I really should now. We are one hundred percent going to throw what little money we have at you, and we're going to buy all of it. We're going to make that happen. Fantastic! I would love that. But yeah, it was it got shared a lot on Facebook. The one yeah. where I just go around and I have a lot of short Brisbane facts, and it never really reached the same heights. As mm. it did from there. So that was a bit discouraging. I still got, you know, some mediocre views. People were watching. And from that, I gained a new audience that I had not seen before. It was not, it was all people I did not know. Yeah. It was no longer, oh, that's probably a friend of a friend of a friend. Now it was like, I do not know who that is. There is no connection. That's the, uh, that's the moment where, you know, that's the success meter, it seems. Definitely. You know what I mean? And it was great that some people stuck around. It was a shame not everyone did, but I guess you learn how fickle these things are. Yeah, it's tough. It's very tough. Um, yeah, so I then I recorded Love You Brisbane. I did a cover of that beautiful song. That's so funny. So you're a big fan of Brisbane, obviously. Yeah. You, you probably have more anecdotal and like just historical knowledge of this place than probably anyone else. 
Do you feel this now that you've done that and you've become so connected to Brisbane that you have a certain like uh, a, not a commitment, but uh, you, you feel like you ha- like a responsibility to uh, sort of like stay in Brisbane and keep making stuff that's Brisbane centric. One hundred percent. Yeah. I because I was thinking about legitimately moving somewhere else because mm. I realized the opportunities weren't there. But here is my home. Here is where I feel safe. There are Brisbane stories to tell. I may have to move one day, but this will always be home and always be the heart. Um, I'm a big fan of John Waters, and I might get to him a bit later, but all of his films are set in Baltimore. Yeah. And I like, I love that idea. That's his hometown. And I like to think everything I do is set in Brisbane, even when it's in outer space. Yeah. <laughs> or at least Queensland centric, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. nearby, like the Sunshine Coast, the Gold Coast, things that are part of. Yeah. We are so lucky. We have two. We may not have a beach, but we have two very different beaches. What are you talking about? The from. artificial beach at South Bank. Oh, one hundred percent. Completely forgot. How could that slip the, my mind? One of the best beaches in the world. I think it's under renovation at the moment. I don't. I don't know. I feel like I. Uh, m- the biggest thing. I mean, you would know. I would assume about just like how much like chlorine they have to like pump into that thing. Just so like, much. But it's like it's just like a toxic wasteland. I know people that refuse to swim there, and I go, "Be proud." <laughs> so we, we, it's in the middle of here. You'll come out of there, like it'll it'll just like burn off all the dead layers of skin. You'll come out a new man, like <laughs> quite literally. But yeah, I I got to a point with Warren Logie where I couldn't sustain it anymore. Yep. So. I was still uploading a video every week. I tried some other content. I was mm-hmm. just like, oh, let's upload this other idea and got like silence. Mm. And it was it was a thing where I was like, oh, do people like me just because of the Brisbane? Do people like my humor? Where does it sit? It was a bit of a lesson. Yeah. Because I made Faux Facade to be like the channel because I realized whenever I had a project, I'd start a new YouTube channel, I'd start a new Facebook page and you'd have to start from the ground up. So was was the Faux Facade channel originally called like Beautiful Brisbane? No, it was called Faux Facade from the beginning because when I started that, I made a conscious decision. I need to make a name now that's going to stick. Before I was operating under the name Silly Moonface Productions (laughs) and that was for my stupid stuff. And I was like, I need to kind of have a bit of a rebirth. Do you remember the show um, uh, Bear in the Big Blue House? Well, yes. I feel like that would be a show that you would definitely remember. I love uh, Bear But when you say house. Silly Moon, I just think of the moon from... Of Luna, yes. Yep. Classic show. You should do the gritty reboot version of that <laughs> series. Like Bear in the Big Blue House, but it's like... It's like Die Hard, you know what I mean? He'd be like a gay bear <laughs> in the Big Blue House. And it'd be some place where all sorts of misfits go to yeah. when they're like kicked out of home. This is legitimately. If anyone wants to help us make the gritty reboot of Bear in the Big Blue House, who I wonder who has the rights. Was that like an ABC show? I or? think the rights are tied up between Disney <laughs> and that's going to be hard and the Jim Henson Company. Okay. I think the Jim Henson Company still owns most of the rights. Hopefully. Okay. Damn. Anyways, we'll get there eventually. We'll get there eventually. We'll put on the slate for twenty forty five. But yeah, I took a break from Beautiful Brisbane and I went back and did an occasional side episode. Like I did one for the anniversary of Expo and yep. for the Commonwealth Games when we had the Commonwealth Games here. I was very proud of those two episodes because I went through a period where I was thinking of quitting mm. filmmaking 100%. Wow. Um, the main reason was I got this idea in my head. I think it's time to make a short film, put in festivals, get people to see me. Mm-hmm. And... I wrote this film called Hooked on It (laughs) and it was going to be shot over two days at my friend Rebel's house. Two days. Yeah, that was the plan. Two days at my friend Rebel's house and she had a lot of like knitted stuff and crocheted bits and pieces and costumes and I thought, let's let's make a film out of that. Let's use what you have. And I one of the big things was like, oh, I'm going to rent a lens so I can have like a different lens and everything's gonna be real because everything had been so green screen focused yeah yep. and warren did so well and he featured very little green screen yeah i was like let's let's try that it's more reliable too yeah you can see it real quick though is the cameras all good still rolling okay sweet continue um so i and we were all walking around rebel's schedule and she was currently she was currently working for the red cross and she only had a few days off and i was like i'm gonna squeeze you into here okay and you're gonna look 
you're going to look good in the crochet stuff and it's it's going to happen. So I wrote a little treatment and then things just fell by the wayside and it was yeah. like, oh, that's been delayed, that's been delayed. And so eventually in early, I think it was early last year, yeah, I was like, okay, let's finally make that film. And I put it together, shot it across maybe three days, built a little set, started editing it together and was like, oh... This isn't very good. What was the was the script similar to to what it is now, or was it very was it similar? Very um, had a very different diverged to a very different place. So kind okay. of the <laughs> middle of the film is very much the same. Okay. The beginning and ending is yeah one hundred percent totally different. There you go. Originally, a lot of it was going to have voiceover and kind of like internal monologues, and then it turned into more of like a silent film. Mm, I mean, yeah. there is dialogue, but there's a lot of like silent film parts to it. 100%, yeah. So yeah, I finished kind of a draft and I showed it to people and was like, eh, I don't really like this. And around the time we had just, um, Rebel had met Willem Whitfield, who I collaborated with on Hooked On It, on the final one. Okay. And I was showing it to him. And at the time I was very intimidated by him because he'd done a lot of the film stuff and I'd hardly met anyone else that did the same stuff that I did. And I showed it to him and he was like, eh. And I was like, eh. <laughs> and it just hit me and I got really depressed and was like, oh, my stuff's terrible. I showed him Hypermarket Heroes, tried to show him other stuff. And I was just getting like a, a blank reaction to everything. That's rough. And I was 100% convinced filmmaking's not for me. I, I, I took all the negative stuff where I was like, oh, Beautiful Brisbane was a success, but its views have started going down. This is too hard. At the time, I was unemployed as well. Mm -hmm. I was desperately looking for wow. any side work. I was just in a really rough space. And I one hundred. I got to a point where I made my YouTube channel private. I mean, wow. I, was, I was out of my head. I was crazy. And on this cliffhanger, we go to an ad break. <laughs> when you're a woman like me, you deserve to look and feel your best. So when I do my hair, I insist on the best. Can pay pineapple fresh, freeze holds frizz control, keeps my hair looking and smelling delicious, while keeping jobs in Australia and not going to those overseas commies. <laughs> Pickled side effects may include loss of speech, which is not a problem, as women were meant to be seen and not heard. Pick can pay pineapple fresh freeze holds frizz control in the beauty aisle next to the bleach. All right, and, and welcome back to this dark point in your career. Dark point in my career, 100%. YouTube channel's private. You're quitting filmmaking. Hooked on Knit is, a, is, a, is, is not what you hoped it would be. No, and I was convinced that this story was brilliant. Yeah, because a bit of backstory was I really got heavily into John Waters. Yes, who is my inspiration. That's he, Pink Flamingo, Pink right? Pink Flamingos. Yep. Yes. For those that are very uninitiated, he was behind Hairspray, the uh, original yeah. film that then spawned the musical that then made the remake, and that was like the cleanest film he'd ever made. He was well known in the past for making really outrageous films like Pink Flamingos, mm. which is infamous for Divine eating dog shit. Yeah, I, I remember ending. when... Uh, so Joey Hughes, who is usually here for these, uh, but he's in, he's in Europe at the moment enjoying himself. But we were in an FTV class, like film television at, at, at high school. And I remember the day vividly when he came in, he's like, I just found John Waters. There's a movie called Pl Pink Flamingos. You have to watch it. This girl like eats literal shit, and like, so from then on, I just can't forget it. It's mayhem, but amongst the mayhem, there's a, there's a style, and there's something, there's a heart behind it all. It's very weird. Yeah, it's like anarchy, but there's still there's something nice behind it. He's still very comfortable, and, and I love his later films <laughs> when he got over his crazy. I mean, I love his stuff as well but polyester yeah. is like this film that sits in the middle of his career it's just before he did hairspray mm -hmm. and just after desperate living a bit of a gap and polyester is like this transitional film to him going to mainstream hollywood and it's just enough wrong with just enough right it's it's a perfect blend and especially polyester really has influenced hooked on it okay in its cool. style like a lot of those circle wipes and yep yep aesthetics and colors so I was watching this and I was like, I'm going to make 
like a John Waters inspired short film. Yeah. I've been enlightened by his work and I watched a lot of other things that have been like inspired by him or mm. used a lot of the same actors. Um, so I was kind of like a changed man with my style and I was so excited to make it that it really hurt me that it was not any good. Yeah. It was, it was just off. Like it just seemed the acting, my direction, I gave the wrong direction to Rebel, who is the lead in this. She was doing very like TV presenting acting. Mm -hmm. And it's what I was asking for her. Cause I was going to go for a very weird fake style I'd just been watching a lot of Amy Sedaris's um, Strangers with Candy, which is an underrated, beautiful comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, It ran for three seasons in the late 90s, I think. I was watching a lot of it, and it had a lot of that type of style because it was all based off old PSAs, and which Hooked on It does a bit of like the reefer madness. Here's a scientist in a coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very inspired by that. And that was there from the beginning. That was still... Okay, cool. That was there from the beginning. I had a really strong vision for it. It was terrible. Um, I that time, I started going to therapy about many other things. And through it, including I was... Including ta- your knitting addiction. Including my knitting addiction. And through that, I was saying how I wanted to quit filmmaking. And my therapist was kind of nodding ahead and going, okay, that's a bit weird. And then I don't know what happened... But I, I went off... I think I started working on other people. Yeah, that's what it was. Willem, this guy I just met, mm-hmm. was doing this 24-hour news broadcast okay. thing for a theatre festival. It was a crazy idea. I think it didn't run for 24 hours. It was like 18 <laughs> hours or something. And I worked on that. And for the first time, I was no longer in the driver's seat. Yeah. And I could do something that didn't matter. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is just playing around having fun. Yeah, yeah. And I started doing that. So I was still doing filmmaking stuff, but I wasn't really putting myself out there. I was just playing backseat and that was just distracting me, basically. Mm -hmm. I was completely distracted. But then I showed it to another friend. It was like, what happened to that knitting film? I was like, oh, I'm I'm not doing that anymore. She's like, come on, show it to me. So I showed it to her. And she's like, this is the best thing I've ever seen you make. (laughs) And I was like, no, this is the worst thing I've ever made. And she's like... Yes, this is wrong with it and this wrong with it, but I love what you're doing, the story and this. It, it's just made me feel something that your other work hasn't. And at that point, I was like, ooh, I wonder... All it took was a little, little light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I was like, maybe I should do this again. Oh, that's what else happened. I started writing Deep Probe 7 at the same time. Oh, So okay. I was kind of wandering in the desert going, oh, I'll do a b- few seconds of this. I'll do a yep. few seconds of that, but not really committing to anything. Yeah. And so I wrote like a pilot for Deep Probe 7 and got people around to have a reading. Okay, cool. Of the script. And so Always one of my favorite things. Yeah, I love a good reading. And we just had a reading recently for an upcoming project, which probably won't be made for another two years. Mm -hmm. But it's this type of sowing the seed and going, ah, that idea is worth it or this needs to be changed. So I found that really reinvigorates. Yeah, it reinvigorates me to get people around reading. And during that same time, one of the lead actors, um, Michael Nunn, in Deep Probe 7 got cast in a show and was unavailable. Damn. And I was like, oh, I was all kind of ready to get into this and making this yeah. new space show I had a great idea for. And I was like, well, I have a like a two-month gap in my schedule till he's kind of free again. Maybe I should try reshooting Hooked on It. So you got rehooked on It, essentially. I got rehooked on It. You got back into it. And so I was able to fold in Willem, who I'd just collaborated with on another project of his, Mm -hmm. was like, do you want to... Because he was in the original one just as an actor. Okay. And I was like, do you want to help me with the cinematography? Because I knew that was a bit of a thing I wasn't too keen on. On my first one, wasn't that good looking. He did wonders with that. He really helped Mm. shape the look of that. Is there any original footage from your original version in the current one? Not at all. Okay. Every single sh- oh. scene is reshot. Okay, and even cool. scenes in the final Hooked on It were reshot ah, and okay. recast. Okay. Wow. I had went gone through so many changes to form it into what I wanted it to be. That's good, though. You yeah. Gotta, you got to do that. 100%. So we'd spend nights. So Because my old, you know, I shot Hyper Market Heroes in a day. Mm-hmm. And the other Hooked on It was shot in kind of two days. And I realized that this rushing around to get mm. it fast and working through people's schedules and when I've got locations free, that's what was making my work a bit low quality. Yeah. So we took a lot of time, like the scene where she gives birth to 
a crochet <laughs> monster. <laughs> yeah. Took a whole night to film. Okay, yeah. In the first one, I did that in one take. Yeah. And this was like, let's do it the whole night, different angles, light it well. I know what you mean. And it made such a difference. Mm -hmm. It changed Mm -hmm. my whole working with it. And I spent longer on the production design for each scene. And I'd accumulated a lot of crochet in the first one and just had it sitting in a bag. And I was like, you know what? I'll buy even more this time. Because that was my Build first question. Was like, did you knit it all yourself? And then, But you said that you uh, had, you know, sourced them. Like thrift a, shops. A long time. A lot of thrift shops. And we just had them lying around both yeah. of our houses. Do you still have them? Yeah, I still <laughs> have a big, bold bag. Uh, we did an interactive screening of it um, oh, wow. a while back. That's cool. And we bu- re- rebuilt the hallway of knitted stuff and had people walk through it. So it's there for Damn. for moments like that. That is a fever dream I would love to to witness. Well, one day I'd, I'd like to bring it back. I'd like to do another proper screening of it. I was going to say you, sh- you should do a... I was going to try and pitch you a sequel just then, but then I was like, no, maybe... It sits within its own thing. I've I've got a spiritual successor on its way, but I think that yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I we shot it over weeks and weeks, and then there were these gaps where I was like, okay, oh, I might redo that bit, and so we kind of did pickups, and we didn't really have an ending still. Okay. <laughs> it was a bit odd. We had an ending that originally was there, but it was a bit too hard to film. It involved a thrift shop and someone climbing in one of those donation bins. Okay. It went all over the place. Um, Also, oh, the one thing I did make for that film was Mm -hmm. the monster. Yeah, no, the monster is amazing. Is is that like two people and like two people inside that? (laughs) Um, So, so the the one of my the biggest laughs every time I've watched it is uh, is the moment on the couch with the legs coming up and just oh man, I wish I wish if pretty much the only people who know what I'm talking about is the people who are at the film festival. Yes, but, uh, because it has not been picked up anywhere else yet. It, it exists privately locked onto Film Freeway. 100%. So I hope that uh, that one day people will, will be either in a cinema or somewhere at, a, at an interactive screening and we'll get to witness this beautiful moment. Where that would be the plan. And so I got to, this was the exciting part with the score. Mm. I managed to get Barry Morgan from Barry Morgan's World of Organs to <laughs> provide... How did you do that? So how did <laughs> how did this happen? So we were, I think we had wrapped the film and we were watching a draft. Yeah. And uh, Willem was like, "So who are you going to get to do the score? Because obviously the temp music I used, I couldn't use. Yeah. I got a lot of old organ recordings from like um, old, like party records from the sixties and seventies. Okay. Cool. And I couldn't clear them because I yeah. didn't. I couldn't find the rights holders. Yep. And He was like, anyone in the world who could do the music. Like, if you could, if you had all the money in the world, who would you choose? And I said, Barry Morgan from Mm -hmm. Spicks and Specs. Mm -hmm. He was on like twice and just played a medley of things. He's this fantastic performer. He has the biggest smile, wears safari suits, and plays the organ. And I was like, oh, that's actually achievable. I could contact him. So I tracked down his contact details and we arranged a price. And he went into the studio. And recorded the music. It was surreal. That's so cool. Most of the film's budget was the score. <laughs> but it works. I mean, like you're talking about like the silent film elements that mm. are in there and the the score really carries a lot of the film, gives it a gives it a momentum and it it just works really well. Like I don't know how it would have turned out if you if you didn't have Barry Morgan. Because, yeah, I I was didn't know what I wanted for the score for a bit. Once I found the organ thing, I was like very sold on it. Mm. And that's what delayed its release. I could have released it in 2017. Not 2017. That wasn't made then. 2018. That's yeah. The, Years are weird. Like, late last year. Um, but I didn't because I, that score was holding me back. But I got it out and... Now I'm I'm waiting on a certain festival in Melbourne, which I found out at the end of the month, Ooh. if I get into that. And if I don't, I think I'm going to release it publicly because it's about time. It's about time. Everyone else got to see it. I don't know why it doesn't get picked up. I mean, I do realize that the sound could be better. The visuals, why beautiful. It was shot on a Canon 600D. It's the same one I've been shooting on for my entire career. I've been using newer lenses, but I think it's about time. 
But I think the the thing that that works it is it. I mean, technical flaws are are like are tough and like you know you. I think that you and all of your content. It's not just in hooked on knit. You find really creative ways to like just sort of like take those limitations and then like you know like you'll you have your VHS effects like it just it fits. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I feel like the part of the charm of that movie was that it was sort of like it had a homemade quality, but it you tied it into the. Uh, the uh, verisimilitude of the world, you know what I mean? Like it made sense as the, uh, you know, the public service announcement mm. sort of, sort of vibe. So, and that's what's what I aim I for. Everything to have kind of a. Even back when I was a production designer for theatre, everyone was always saying your sets are so homely, and mm. you always feel like you want to live in them because there's always like little nooks and places that you just want to sit and relax in. I always bring back a, a little feeling of the past in everything because I, I mean I used to watch taped you know how i had my copy of willy wonka in the chocolate factory so good the commercials in that film that were filmed off tv were like six years old and i was still watching them yeah and i'd always i would never fast forward the commercials because it or it took me back to a time where i was like oh that's simpler yeah i love just the late 20th century 50s to 90s gold. anything between there is gold i think that was the peak of pop culture i do some understand respects. Like there's a there's a resource that they give us here called uh, edu.tv and it's basically like uh, you you it's like a library of films and TV that's online but they're all recorded off of TV or like recorded off of Foxtel and stuff like that so like you go on to watch like I don't know you'll be studying like a film and you'll go on to watch it and it'll open with like the following program is rated M and then like. And they'll just be little things like it'll cut to an ad break briefly, but like they'll cut out the ad breaks, but yeah. like you'll get a snippet of like something. And like, man, I totally get what you mean where it's like just it it just brings you back into watching a movie on TV late mm. at night. Um, there's something about it. That's why I love watching continuity. It's a you can watch the program announcements mm. from old on YouTube. People upload kind That's of the cool. end credits of something and what goes on in between the programs. Oh wow! It's kind of like a relic from a bygone era of entertainment. Mm -hmm. It made everything feel a lot grander. Whereas now there's no fanfare before anything. You kind of just yeah click in exactly. Which takes me to it's a bit of a side diversion, but DL Let's Cinemas. Go. Okay. Have you heard of DL Cinemas? I have not heard of DL Cinemas. It's it's only documented verbally through people that have experienced it. Okay. So I have a home cinema, okay, and and it's called DL Cinemas. Ah, oh. and it's it may just be a room right. with a David bed Lawrence. sheet. Yeah, there you go. It took me a second. It <laughs> may just be a room with velvet curtains all right. around it, <laughs> and a bed sheet and a projector, but it's an experience. Ooh. You show up at the door, right, and there is Shirley, yes, a receptionist, yes, and sometimes I spring this upon people I haven't seen in four years, so they they show up and they're like, "Where's David?" Who, who's this? Yeah. <laughs> and Shirley has like a sign-in book and a telephone, like oh a full reception God. desk. And Shirley's in like coat and tails, but with like a takeaway hat on. Okay. Like they work at a burger joint. Yep. And you get taken <laughs> through my house and it's always themed differently to something else. It's really dark with lighting, music, sound, different themed rooms until you get taken down to a snack bar. Wow. With like a marquee with DL Cinemas on it. That leads you through velvet curtains into a starfield hallway, My God. which then Shirley abandons you in, and you have to find your way into the cinema. This is amazing. How, how, and where, and when will DL Cinemas next appear? Well, last time we did it was for the Hooked on It kind of family and friends premiere. Amazing. Um, but who knows what will happen in the future? I'm very excited. And there's commercials. Always commercials before the film. Yeah, and like, like trailers for the snack bar, which are custom made, yep. like custom made commercials just for local for Aspley businesses, wow. just for DL Cinemas. Yeah, that's so cool. Do people have to pay to come, or is it usually it's free? Usually I do free nights, but I have charged on occasion. My God, yeah. this is the future of cinema. This the, is like yeah. you know the cinema experience is dying. Everyone's staying at home watching Netflix. Uh, the big chains are like you know. They're not really support. They, you know, they're, they're just playing the big blockbusters now. This is the future. It's, it's uh, the personal touch. Yeah. That's the tagline. Yeah, come come into my house and, and, and get see a what's personal gonna... touch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh no, <laughs> no, no. DL Cinemas. Yeah. That's amazing. That's such a good, uh, such a good idea. 
So um, that's what I want to ask next to them is is what do we expect next? Because Deep Probe 7 has finished. If you haven't watched Deep Probe 7, you should definitely watch Deep Probe 7. Yeah. So it's just quickly fantastic. on Deep Probe 7, yes. it started off as a jumpsuit. There was a jumpsuit that I saw my friend Rebel wearing. Hey, that you were like, that's a show. That's a show. And after maybe two years after that, I finally made it, it, built a spaceship. Right, so where do you do all of your practical effects and stuff like that? Is that all just done at home? All like, at my house, yeah. It's insane. Just your the the mix of practical and visual effects. It's like you you, I suppose it's like you can see yourself. Like you, talk, you said, you took you taught yourself three D modeling. You know, you're going through all of these different things. You're king and stuff like that. It's like all of your skills are just like coming together. And I feel like Deep Probe 7 is just like the ultimate display of like all of your previous works. And that's what made it so easy to do was because yeah. I was like, oh, I know how to do that. I know how to do that. Yeah. Know, you know. It's so funny. But I'm still learning stuff every day. Mm-hmm. I only learned how to use trim paths properly in After Effects last night. <laughs> Congratulations. Because I had done it on another plugin, but I didn't realize it was just available. Yeah, just through After Effects. Oh, I feel like such an idiot, but also I feel enlightened. That's kind of uh, filmmaking. Like, I to me the the biggest thing that I that I that I tell people about filmmaking is that it's just problem solving under the guise of creativity. Like, all it is is yeah. like I've got this thing I want to do, and then you go into it, and there's no problems, and then immediately there's fifty problems, and then slowly you just like solve problems until there's no problems left to solve, or you just give up. Yeah, that's filmmaking. And you should never give up. That's that's what I've learned. Um, 100%. No, there's always going to be a way to get it to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Deep Probe was filmed over three weekends and that was the first show I actually transferred to VHS and transferred wow. it back into the computer. That's amazing. I was really impressed with like the opening titles. It was everything I wanted them to be. I was like, this feels like a legitimate old show. Yeah. I oh, was so pleased with it. But yeah, check out Deep Probe 7. Do it. It needs a few more views, I think. <laughs> and it's worth a view. It's very fun. It's a lot of fun. It is, it is. It's a bit saucy and racy, but like nothing actually happens. It's all in your head. The whole thing is within your it's head. It's kind of like with Hooked on Knit too. Yes, like you the know? drug trip hallucination scene. What you see is <laughs> entirely your fault. It is in, in, in an interesting way. I, rem- I remember watching that uh, when you submitted it, it uh, and we, we sort of sat down. We waited until we got quite a few submissions, and then we sort of like sat them down. And, like, when you watch all of them back to back and then you get to that scene and you're just like, can we show this? Like, we sort of had to look at each other. I was like, can we actually show this in a cinema that's, like, an all ages, supposedly? And then we were like, well, yeah, technically there's no nudity. There's no, like, it's just suggestion. And it's, 100, it's yeah. genius. I really enjoy <laughs> putting it in the viewer's head. They get to decide. And it, it because they feel bad at the end. It's like, oh, that was my fault. I made that. I saw it. <laughs> How do you script that scene though? I and mean, this is not going to make any sense to anyone who hasn't seen it. But like, did you write what it like was, or did you just say like the you know the tentacle, not the tentacles, the tendrils of n- knitting, like unspool? Like, how did you did you just write like it's supposed to look like sex? No, I was kind of. I was like a. Um, the use of carrots and donuts oh my God. and a young thing. It was kind of scripted a bit, improv a bit. I was going to say, it seemed like it was sort of like a bit improv. Yeah. What's funny is the improv mainly came from the first time we filmed Hooked on It. Oh, uh, okay. And what we did is we just recreated what we did yeah, originally. That's so funny. So that there is a, an older version of that scene that exists. Oh, one, yeah, <laughs> there is. And it's, it's very similar. And there's oh, a few yeah. more other weird things and we kind of, condensed it down more my biggest regret with that scene is the usage of food because now i think about it it's there's already the yarn analogies because that came from another film idea i i do a lot of i'm a very andrew lloyd webber in that way if you're not aware andrew lloyd webber is a master thief of creative content he steals his own stuff he steals other people's stuff but rejigs it and repurposes it that you don't realize Mm mm-hmm and that's what I like to do. I like to take a bit of stuff that didn't work, that was from an idea that never got made and was like, oh, 
we'll use that one. That's why there's some similarities between Deep Probe 7 and Hooked on It. Yeah. Because there was a time when I was writing the Deep Probe scripts that Hooked on It was never going to happen. So you sort of like, yeah, appropriated your own works. Yeah. So there's a bit of similarities there. That's good. Well, anything that is similar to Hooked on It, I will watch because oh, cause it's amazing and you should too. So thank you for coming on today on this episode. You've taken us through such a wild ride of your life and your, your career so far. So I'm excited. What, what, what do we look out for next? Well, we've wor- I'm working on a short film called Square Eyes, which is about a lady that watches too much TV. Ooh, so it's like spiritual success. It's the spiritual one. success that are hooked on it. Very visually strange. Then I'm going back to my roots and making a film similar to Gingy the Wildcat of Alabama wow. called The Far Out Jive Turkeys. Okay. About a lesbian pop group from the 1960s I'm that so kill people to get to a certain music festival, which is not unlike the Eurovision Song Contest. Wow. You better... Th- something. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's that or, or maybe it's uh, Square Eyes, but we need something at Light Up 2020. Well, I hope Please. Square Eyes will be ready in time because Square Eyes will be film festival length. Mm-hmm. I think Jive Turkeys is going to be like a full half hour. Wow. That's amazing. TV pilot that will never get made. <laughs> Well, whatever it is, even if you just submit Coke versus Pepsi into <laughs> Light Up 2020, we will we will happily take anything. I will be there with bells on. Yes, 100%. Drinking drinking Coke when yes. you should be drinking Pepsi, which is the superior drink. So please sponsor us, Pepsi. <laughs> all right, thank you very much for coming on. We'll have uh, all of your links below. People should go to fofasad.com, the yeah. new website. New website. Um, follow Faux Facade on YouTube, I'm guessing. Yes, it's just slash Faux Facade, like YouTube slash Faux Facade. How, where else should people go? Uh, Facebook, we have a page there. Um, that's about just it. Just type it in. Yeah, yeah just yeah, yeah. Ple- please subscribe and watch. That's we'll have all the links say. below. There'll be a little eye that pops up right now that can send you right there. So thank you very much for coming on. And that it's was... It's been a pleasure. That was episode 20 of the Slob Podcast. Thank you very much. If you missed it, check out our new Musicians Play series where we get musicians and then they play games and there's some fun events slash challenges involved. Uh, and then we'll be back with some more movies of the future in Slop next month. Like, subscribe. Subscribe? I, again, I can never say <laughs> the subscribe word. Hit the bell, as me- this this man said over here. And I hope to see you at a DL Cinemas uh, experience. You'll be a welcome guest. Thank you very much. Well... Thank you very much for coming on and sharing the word about this beautiful city and its beautiful creators. See you next time. Goodbye.